This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're beginning a new month, and that means a new series. Typically, the month of May kicks off prom season in America. For those of you lamenting the postponement of this rite of passage for teens, let me just point out that I myself never attended a prom, and I turned out okay. Well, mostly okay. To be honest, I really didn't get all the hoopla surrounding the prom when I was in high school. To me, it seemed like an overhyped and overpriced dance where social convention dictated you wore formal attire that I wouldn't be caught dead in. But hey, I guess that was just the rebel part of my teenage self. And by the way, when Ducky showed up at his prom, I was very disappointed. What a sellout. Anywho, I hope that those of you who have to sit out this dance feel a little better knowing that you still rock whether or not you attend prom. In this series, Last Dance, you'll hear stories of people who thought attending their prom was so earth-shatteringly important, they may have been willing to kill to not miss it. These are some wild stories, so buckle up. This is Chapter 1 of Last Dance, the case of Adam Sapikowski. It was Saturday, May 14th, 2005, and Pamela Powell was still unable to reach her sister Allison. Allison and her family lived in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, one state south of Pamela's home in Virginia. The sisters spoke somewhat regularly, but both were busy with their families and jobs, so at first she wasn't too worried when she couldn't reach Allison by phone. But Mother's Day had fallen on the previous Sunday, and now a whole week had passed since Pamela had called and left a message wishing Allison a happy holiday, with no return call. 49-year-old Allison Sapikowski and her husband Jim, age 52, worked together at an oil and gas exploration company that Jim had founded and named J5. Jim traveled a bit for work, but Allison usually stayed in Chapel Hill to oversee the business and care for their two children, Lauren and Adam. Lauren was a freshman at college, living away from home now, while she attended school in Virginia. Adam, age 16 and a junior in high school, was the only child still living at home. Jim had previously been married and had two adult sons as well, Chris and Jim Jr. Now going on two weeks since she'd been able to reach the family, Pamela called the Chapel Hill police to report her concern. She told them that she'd also left messages for her nephew, Adam Sapikowski, but he had not returned her calls either. That morning, officers arrived at the Sapikowski house, located at 29 Whitley Drive. The five-bedroom, five-bath, 5,700-square-foot home was located in the upscale Oaks neighborhood of Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill is a college town of some 50,000 residents and home to the University of North Carolina. They knocked at the door for several minutes, but there was no answer. Questioning the neighbors, they were told that they had not seen either Jim or Allison Sapikowski for several days. Some of them told officers they thought it was odd that the lights around their circular driveway had been lit up night and day for at least a week, which was unusual. They asked about other occupants of the house and were told that the Sapikowski's teenage son, Adam, drove a newer SUV, a Chevy Tahoe, but they hadn't seen it around lately either. As they continued their inquiries, the officers learned the name of Adam's girlfriend and were told that she lived in the neighborhood as well. They drove over to the girl's house to see if she had been in contact with either her boyfriend or his parents. The girl told them that for the last couple of weeks, Adam had been staying off and on at a nearby hotel, the courtyard by Marriott in Durham. Was he with his parents, they asked? No, Adam was staying there alone, she replied. This was odd, they thought. But when they discovered that the boy was a minor, just 16 years old, they decided it would be advisable to have another adult family member join them to question Adam. They were able to get in touch with Jim Sapikowski's adult son, Chris who lived in a nearby town. He met up with officers to accompany them to the Marriott to locate Adam. 
Adam Sapikowski was indeed registered at the Marriott and was in his hotel room when the officers arrived. They asked Adam to drive back with them and his half-brother Chris to his house to answer some questions. By this time, the police must have suspected that Adam had information regarding the whereabouts of his parents. On the way back to the house, they began to question him about when he last saw them. I can only imagine that, having been picked up by uniformed officers and transported back to Whitley Drive, the 16-year-old must have been nervous. But Adam had a ready answer, saying his parents had left town a week earlier. They had gone to Texas to visit his other half-brother, Jim Jr., who also lived in El Paso. Had he spoken with them since, the officers asked? No, Adam replied. He had not seen or heard from them since they left. This, I'm sure the officers thought, made no sense. That a well-respected and responsible couple, like Jim and Allison Sapikowski, would leave their minor son while they went out of town and not call or check in for several days seemed implausible. And why would Adam leave his home, which he had all to himself, while his parents were away and check into a hotel. No, something was very fishy here. It became even fishier when they reached the house and asked Adam to let them in so they could check things out. And he told them he didn't have a key. At this point, I can imagine the officers giving each other a knowing glance. This boy was hiding something. Maybe his parents had gone out of town and he'd thrown an unauthorized party and wrecked the house. He wouldn't be the first teenager to do so. In any case, they weren't going to let this stop them from entering the home. They still needed to find Mr. and Mrs. Sapikowski. The officers went to a side garage door and, using a credit card to slide the lock open, entered the residence. As soon as they walked into the main portion of the house, the smell hit them. They knew the odor, as would anyone who has ever smelled a decomposing body. Whether Adam was with them at this time is not in the record, but I would assume the officers might have placed him in their car or had him and his older brother stand outside until they finished searching the house. The smell was stronger as they moved toward the master bedroom, located at the end of a hallway. The door to the bedroom was closed, and in front of it were four chairs barricading the door. There was a towel stuffed underneath the door itself. The officers now backed away, careful not to disturb anything they were pretty sure that this was now an active crime scene. They radioed in and reported what they'd encountered. An investigator soon arrived. Photos were taken of the door before it was opened to document the scene. The chairs and towel were removed, and they entered the bedroom. There, just behind the door, they discovered the body of Jim Sapikowski. He'd been wrapped in a blanket, and blood had pooled under his body. He was fully dressed in athletic clothes. A shotgun shell lay on the floor nearby. Continuing on into the room, they followed a trail of blood to the master bathroom. Inside, next to the tub, lay the body of Allison Sapikowski. She'd also been wrapped in blankets, and dried blood covered the floor underneath her and the blankets. An unfired shotgun shell was found near her body. She was dressed in a nightgown. Investigators now made a careful canvas of the home. A shotgun and a box of shells were discovered. Shell casings were found in the home, one in the kitchen, one in the breakfast nook, and one that lay near Jim's body in the bedroom. The unfired shell near Allison was the fourth one found at the crime scene. Detectives then returned to Adam Sapikowski to tell him what they'd found. They read him his rights and asked him if he had anything to say. 16-year-old Adam Sapikowski then confessed to the murders of his parents. Adam Sapikowski was taken into custody and quickly confessed to the murder of his parents. The 16-year-old was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. He would be charged as an adult. When the news broke that James Sapikowski and his wife Allison were murdered in their home by their own son, the community was stunned. The couple was described as successful, active in the community, and well-liked. The family was said to be close-knit. Both of the couple's children had attended the Durham Academy, a private school with a tuition of $16,000 per year. The school provided gourmet lunches, including Thai food and sushi, on its menu. 
Their daughter, Lauren, had graduated the previous spring and enrolled in Washington and Lee University that fall. Adam was said to be less outgoing than his sister, who was active in school theater productions. He was quieter, but was said to be polite and pleasant. James Sapikowski, called Big Jim by his friends on account of his six-foot-five-inch frame and his larger-than-life personality, was very popular in the community. He served as the head coach of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill club ice hockey team. His players looked up to Coach Jim as a father figure who was always around to lend an ear, give advice, and mentor his players. Jim also participated in a pickup ice hockey team himself, so was a frequent present at the hockey rink, showing up four or more times per week. Jim Sapikowski was described as a strong-willed man who exuded confidence and had a hard-driving attitude, which he'd used towards great success in his life. Teammates called him a lovely, friendly guy, but others described him as aggressive and somewhat domineering. Allison Powell Sapikowski was described as self-assured and very smart. She, like her husband, was driven to succeed and worked hard, and was also a dedicated mother to her two children. The couple was generous with their money, giving to charitable and political causes, as well as to the community. Jim was known to purchase 100 tickets at a time for Carolina Hurricane hockey games, gifting them to local children participating in youth hockey leagues. Both Allison and Jim were athletic and encouraged their children to be active. Allison was a tennis player and a member of the country club tennis group. Adam participated in high school athletics, running track and cross country. By all outward appearances, the Sapikowskis seemed to be a good, solid family living the American dream. So much so that when a friend of the family, author and Esquire magazine columnist, Cal Fussman, decided to write a children's book, he made the Sapikowski family his main characters. In the children's book, The Guest Who Threw Tomatoes, Jim, Allison, Lauren, and Adam host a man from Spain who brings fun and excitement to their home when he shares some of his home country's liveliest customs. But like all families, there were at least a couple of issues brewing in the Sapikowski house. In the spring of 2005, Adam had been underperforming at school, and this was concerning to his parents. Jim especially argued with his son over his grades, lecturing him about squandering his opportunity to attend a good college. Jim and Allison even hired a counselor at the cost of $2,000 who could work with their son to find the right college and help him complete the application process. It seems that the tension between Adam and his parents continued to intensify in the last weeks and months leading up to the end of his junior year in high school. But no one could have predicted how serious it would become. I want to introduce you to a great podcast hosted by my friends Laura and Brooke. The Fall Line is a serialized investigative podcast that follows one unsolved case each season. They've just launched season eight, and I know once you take a listen, you'll be a fan too. Here's a clip from The Fall Line. From Exactly Right Media comes The Fall Line, a true crime podcast that digs deep into cold cases that have received little, if any, public attention. The Fall Line is an investigative show covering unsolved murders and disappearances in the southeastern United States. Hosted by a professor and a licensed therapist, the podcast provides a platform to families and victims who have been passed over by other outlets. Through intensive research and compelling narratives, The Fall Line builds the knowledge base on little-known cases of the murdered, the missing, and the unidentified. These are stories you won't hear anywhere else. Tune into The Fall Line on Exactly Right Network for new episodes dropping on Wednesdays. And be sure to check out our back catalog for both episodic and long-form coverage of cases. Listen and subscribe to The Fall Line and all of Exactly Right shows on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. We'd like to thank Hask for sponsoring today's episode. Hask hair care products are used on more Hollywood film and television sets than any other hair care brand. That's because Hask offers good-for-you formulas that won't break the bank. 
There's shampoos, conditioners, deep conditioners, shine oils, and dry shampoos are made with clean ingredients and designed to treat and repair all hair types. Hask's Tea Tree Oil and Rosemary Invigorating Collection is blended with purifying tea tree oil and rosemary to help hydrate and soothe the scalp to refresh your hair and keep it looking healthy. It's great for those with a dry and or irritated scalp and works gently to rid the hair of impurities, leaving your hair full of moisture and shine. My favorite thing about Hask's Tea Tree Oil and Rosemary Collection is it's infused with peppermint oil for that tingling sensation that really energizes my hair follicles. And you can get Hask's Invigorating Formula in shampoo, conditioner, 5-in-1 leave-in spray, or to give your hair a really special treat, use their deep conditioning hair mask. I love to use one of Hask's deep conditioning masks, wrap myself in a big fluffy robe, and let it do its magic on my hair while I sip a nice cup of tea or wine. Now that's a great night. The Hask Tea Tree Oil and Rosemary Invigorating Collection and other Hask products are available on Amazon.com, as well as online and in-store at Ulta, Walmart, Target, and CVS. And we want to congratulate our first winner of a $100 Hask prize pack. Listener Jamie entered for her chance to win at haskbeauty.com slash once and won a bag full of great Hask hair care products. Congratulations, Jamie. For your chance to win Hask's weekly $100 prize pack giveaway, go to haskbeauty.com slash once. That's haskbeauty.com slash once. On the morning of Thursday, April 28, 2005, two days before Adam Sapikowski's junior prom, he took a shotgun and shot his father, 52-year-old Jim Sapikowski, three times. Firing from just a few feet away, he hit his father in the neck, chest, and forehead. The medical examiner would say that any one of these shots would have been quickly fatal. The crime scene would indicate that his father had been shot in the kitchen. A trail of blood would also indicate that his mother had been in the bedroom, still dressed in her nightgown, when she had been shot the first time. The blast had struck her in the shoulder, which was not fatal. She then might have tried to move away from the shooter, making it a few feet toward the master bathroom, before being struck with a second blast, which struck her in the temple, killing her almost instantly. The weapon used in the murders was a single-fire shotgun, that had to be reloaded before each shot. There was one unfired shell lying next to Allison's body. Had Adam stood over his mother, planning to shoot her once again, before determining she was dead, and finally lowering his weapon? It's terrifying to consider that the last thing a mother would see would be the child she gave birth to and raised for 16 years, firing a weapon at her in such a cold, calculated manner. But what Adam did next would almost rival the callousness of the actual murders. He explained to the detectives that after committing his act of parricide, he wrapped each of his parents' bodies in blankets. He then dragged his father's body into the master bedroom. His mother he placed in the bathroom. He then stuffed towels under the door of the bedroom and placed chairs in front of it to barricade it. He changed out of his bloody clothing and hid them in his closet. The next day, Friday, he attended his classes at Durham as usual. The day after that, April 30th, he dressed in formal wear, picked up his girlfriend, and attended his junior prom. Later that evening, Adam Sapikowski invited friends back to his house for an after-prom party while his parents' decomposing corpses still lay in the master bedroom. When his party guests commented that something smelled like it was rotting in his house, He explained it away, saying that the refrigerator was on the fritz and some food had gone bad. The following day, May 1st, Adam checked into the hotel in Durham, located about five miles from his house. He continued to attend school and act as normal, but it appeared he didn't have much of a plan to hide his crime. His parents' bodies remained in the house for the next two weeks while people tried to reach Jim and Allison to no avail. The weekend after the murders was Mother's Day. Allison's sister and daughter must have tried calling to wish her a happy Mother's Day, 
but the phone would continue to ring unanswered, its peals echoing throughout the silent house. Investigators ask the question we all want to know. Why? What could have caused Adam Sapikowski to murder both of his parents? Adam had no prior criminal record, nor even any reports of behavior or discipline problems at school. Adam would claim that he'd shot his parents in self-defense. On a videotaped confession, he told investigators he and his father had gotten into an argument that morning about his grades. His father thought he was spending too much time with his girlfriend and neglecting his studies. Detectives had discovered a report card splattered with Jim Sapikowski's blood at the crime scene. Adam said his father had threatened him with a baseball bat. He claimed that his father had struck him with the bat in the past, and he was in fear that he would do so again. This, Adam said, was what provoked the shooting that day. An aluminum bat was taken by detectives from the home, but there was no evidence that it was used as a weapon. Inside Adam's SUV, police had also discovered camping equipment, food, the shotgun used in the murders, ammunition, and cash. Prosecutors would say that this was evidence Adam was planning to flee. The teen had access to somewhere between $20,000 and $40,000 from his parents' bank accounts. They believed the only reason Adam didn't leave was because he'd asked his girlfriend to go with him, and she refused. They did not believe that Adam's girlfriend or any of his friends knew about the murders. The weekend he was arrested, Adam Sapikowski was taken to the Western Youth Institution in Morganton. After the district attorney charged him as an adult, he was transferred to the Orange County Main Jail and held without bail. Adam's case wound its way slowly through the courts. His attorney would try to present a case for Adam to be released on bond, claiming that the shootings were provoked by history of physical and emotional abuse on the part of Adam's parents. A friend of Adam's was interviewed who said he referred to Jim Sapikowski as Psycho Dad, as he often heard him yelling at Adam. But Adam received no support from his family, who cut ties with him soon after his arrest and confession. They also refused to pay for an attorney, so he was being represented by a public defender. The only people Adam saw as he awaited his trial were his attorney and doctors who were enlisted to assess his mental health for the court. After spending over a year in the county jail, Adam sent a note to his jailers to report that he was feeling suicidal and needed help. He wrote that he was afraid he would, quote, do something crazy, unquote, and hurt himself. He was transferred to John Umstead Hospital and placed on suicide watch. While at Umstead, he was seen by psychiatrists and given several mental health evaluations. He told doctors that he'd heard voices since he was in middle school and began hearing them more frequently before the murders. He said at that time, he'd also felt suicidal and thought about hanging himself. These suicidal feelings were often brought out when his parents criticized him and said he wasn't working hard enough in school, Adam told the psychiatrist. Adam stayed at Umstead Hospital for over a year. There he was given medication and treated for his depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. He was reportedly experiencing flashbacks of killing his parents. When he was no longer deemed to be a threat to himself, he was transferred back to central jail and continued to be monitored. In January 2008, two and a half years after the murders of Jim and Allison Sapikowski, Adam agreed to a plea deal. He went before the judge and pled guilty to felony obstruction of justice and two counts of second-degree murder. He faced a possible prison term of between 40 and 50 years for both murders. When they were told how much time he would probably serve, Jim and Allison's family members agreed to the plea deal. While pleading guilty in front of the judge, Adam cried and whispered, I'm sorry. His sister Lauren was in court, as were his half-brother Chris and his aunt Pamela. 
They all read victim impact statements before Adam was sentenced. Chris choked back tears as he recalled his father playing basketball with him and his friends. He talked about his young daughter, and he said he didn't know how to explain to her why she never got to meet her grandfather. Pamela Powell, Allison's sister, said her sister's death was cruel and senseless and left a deep sadness that would never heal. Lauren Sabakowski, just a year older than her brother, who now faced a lifetime in prison, wrote out her statement and read it to the judge. Quote, Initially, I was unable to speak out about the deaths of my parents. I was in shock and frozen in grief, grief at the loss of my parents and shocked that my brother Adam, who I thought I knew, was responsible for their deaths. Our parents were good and caring people, and they were private people. This unbelievable act not only ended their lives, but also brought unwanted attention to our family. Our parents tried very hard to make our lives happy and full. They loved us unconditionally and were openly and constantly proud of us. We were given every advantage that a child could have, including a good education and the opportunity to develop into contributing citizens. Most importantly, our parents were our best friends. My life and the lives of many others have been shattered by the loss of these wonderful people. I will miss my mother and father every day of my life and forever stand up for the goodness that they brought to our family and others through their kind, loving hearts." Unquote. On February 1, 2008, Orange County Superior Court Judge Carl Fox sentenced Adam Sapikowski to 24 and a half years for the murder of James Sapikowski. The following week, he was sentenced to an additional 20 years in prison for the murder of Allison Powell Sapikowski. This additional time was to be served at the end of his previous sentence for a total of almost 45 years in prison. Soon after he was sentenced, Dean Powell, the executor of his parents' estate, petitioned the court to bar Adam from receiving any money or death benefits from his parents' estate. Adam's attorney argued that his client was entitled to a portion of the estate because he had been insane at the time of the murders. The judge agreed with the executor, and Adam did not receive any money or death benefits. How many times after a tragic crime has occurred have we heard people say, he seemed like such a nice person, or I could never imagine he, she, they could have committed such an act. It goes to show time and time again that we generally have no clue what goes on behind other people's doors. This case is no different. It seems baffling on the surface. What in the world could have caused a seemingly nice normal kid like Adam to deliberately and brutally murder his own parents? Even his sister said that she was shocked at learning her brother Adam, quote, who she thought she knew, unquote, could be responsible for her parents' deaths. Which is to say that afterward, she wondered if she ever knew her brother at all. Yes, it seemed to be a cruel and senseless act, as Ellison's sister said. Senseless because it appeared to come out of the blue and for no apparent reason. These are the types of crimes that keep me up at night with my thoughts going around in circles. It's human nature, I think, or at least my nature, to try and make some sort of sense out of such an incomprehensible crime. However, there may be a few clues to help give some context to what happened on April 28, 2005, even if we can't fully understand and definitely not excuse Adam Sabakowski's crime. We must take the context from what we do know. We know that the Sabakowskis were a family of high achievers. We know that Jim Sapikowski worked hard and used his talents and intellect to provide a very good life for his family. We also know that Allison was no less talented than her husband and would do anything in her power to support and encourage her children to be their best and become happy, successful members of society. Lauren, Adam's sister, was also a gifted student and talented performer. I learned while researching this case that at the time of her parents' deaths, she was rehearsing for a play with her college theater group. Very soon after their murders were discovered and she learned her brother was the shooter, Lauren returned to school and continued with rehearsals. 
She was quoted as saying she would rather get back to work and her commitments, as this was what her mother and father had worked so hard for, to provide her with the opportunity to live out her dreams. And her education and the theater was what she was most passionate about. Lauren's attitude was very much like that of her parents, motivated, hardworking, and focused. Adam, however, had been kind of the odd man out in the family. He was the introvert in a family of extroverts. His father was extremely popular and outgoing. Many people loved Big Jim. Jim Sabakowski was described as big-hearted, if somewhat aggressive. He was a leader, competitive, and very determined in everything he did. He had accomplished quite a bit in his 52 years. It's easy to see how a son can feel overshadowed by such a father. Adam may have even resented the time and attention Jim gave to the players on his team, who were quoted as saying Coach Jim was like a father to them. It's also easy to believe that Jim may have felt frustrated at his son, who was just one year away from graduating high school, a very good school that they'd paid top dollar for him to attend. Adam's parents believed he wasn't working up to his potential. Jim began to demand that Adam get focused and work harder to bring his grades up and take school seriously. Maybe he did yell at his son enough that Adam's friend, jokingly or not, referred to him as Psycho Dad. Was it true that his father had threatened him or even hit him with a baseball bat, as Adam claims? Lauren denies that this ever happened. She says her parents were nothing but kind and loving parents. But I think it's interesting that in her statement, she mentions that they were also, quote, very private people who would have hated the negative attention Adam's behavior brought to the family. Could they have been keeping domestic abuse in the home secret as well? Maybe even from their own daughter who was away at college? We'll never know. There's one other detail that leapt out at me, too. Ice hockey was a very important part of Jim Sapakowski's life. He himself played the sport competitively as well as coached other players and was a fan of his local hockey team. He was so involved in the sport, it was said Jim was at the ice hockey rink almost every day. And yet Adam, his son, did not participate in the sport. Instead, he ran track and cross country. Could this have been deliberate? Did Adam refuse to play ice hockey because he knew how important it was to his father? Was this a way for him to distinguish himself as separate from his father? Was it a way to rebel against him? Or had he played the sport in the past and perhaps hadn't lived up to his father's expectations? Adam told psychiatrists that he'd become suicidal after continually being told by his parents that he wasn't working hard enough in school. Did he also feel pushed beyond his abilities in the sport his father favored? What set off the argument that weekend? It seems that Adam's report card must have played a role as it was found at the crime scene covered in his father's blood. Did Jim threaten Adam physically, as Adam claimed, and result in him grabbing the shotgun to defend himself? Or was Adam just tired of his parents nagging about his grades and in that moment snapped? The fact that he retrieved the shotgun, probably had to load it, and then reloaded it after each shot, tells us that this was not a completely spontaneous act. If he'd fired off one shot and injured or killed his father, that would be one thing. The fact that he fired three times at his father and then went to another room to shoot his mother, wounding her with the first bullet and then making sure to kill her with the second, shows it to be a deliberate and premeditated act. The cold and calculated way the crime was carried out is the reason Adam was given such a lengthy prison sentence. Finally, we must also think about Adam's behavior after brutally murdering his parents. He didn't try to get rid of the bodies or do much at all to cover up his crime. But we have to remember, this was a 16-year-old. He was not a sophisticated criminal, and it was not a well-thought-out crime. One of the most chilling aspects of this crime for most who have reported on it is the fact that Adam attended his junior prom two days after the murders and invited friends to a party at his home afterward, the place where his slain parents' bodies still lay. I have to admit, this detail is just plain bizarre and chilling. Perhaps with his parents dead, Adam felt a sense of freedom, and weirdly, going to the dance was a celebration of that. Or maybe he was in denial of what he had done. Maybe he was able to convince himself for a while that his parents really were just out of town. And what does a 16-year-old do when his parents are away? Throws a party, of course. 
So we can either believe he was a cold-blooded killer or a kid who had lost touch with reality. I'll leave that one for you to decide. The last thing about this case that kept my brain occupied on nights long after I should have been counting sheep was the response by Adam Sapikowski's family. Of course, I felt tremendously sad for the family of Jim and Allison. They articulated very powerfully their sense of pain and loss at Adam's sentencing. The anger and horror they must have felt for the perpetrator of the crime cannot be imagined. But like you, I have heard many stories of murder between relatives, and as traumatic as this is for a family, we almost always hear about one or two family members who support and even defend the accused. The fact is that Adam had to be a pretty messed up 16-year-old to kill both of his parents out of the blue and hide his crime for weeks. That no one in his family seemed to be the least bit interested in seeing or talking to him and definitely didn't expend any energy trying to understand his violent act seems unusual. In the accounts I read, Adam was immediately written off by his family, was not given a penny for his defense, and no one in his family called or visited him after his arrest. Again, I can understand that in the family's grief and anger, they might not have wanted to immediately see their loved one's murderer. But I would think, after some time had passed, they might remember that he was a child when he committed this crime, and later on, reach out to him in some way. However, I found no reports that this has happened. We'll never definitively know what occurred in the Sabakowski family home. Perhaps there were serious problems that were unseen by the outside world. Or perhaps Adam was one of those bad seeds I talked about in a recent series, and he simply decided to free himself of his parents through a selfish act of murder. But the actions he took that morning in 2005 would devastate a family for generations and would guarantee that, for Adam Sapikowski, this would be his very last dance. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. To share your thoughts about this case or anything else true crime related, you can join our Facebook fan page. I've included a link in the show notes. In this episode, I shared an odd detail, that the Sapikowski family were subjects of a children's book. Well, you know how curious I am, so I couldn't let this detail go, and I set out on a search to find the book. It's not widely available, but I was able to get my hands on a copy. I'll be sharing it on the Once Upon a Crime YouTube channel for those of you who are also curious. That will be available soon, so make sure to subscribe to the channel. That link is also in the show notes. Next week, I'll be sharing another chapter in the series Last Dance. I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole on the next case because while it appears to be a cut-and-dried case of murder, there are some lingering questions, and I did my very best to try and flesh out all the nuances of this intriguing true crime. You'll hear that story next week. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Our administrative research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Our copy editor is Crystal Dernan. And original music is by Aaron Michael Goldberg. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>